Hello, so today we're going to have a recorded lecture because I unfortunately cannot make it into class. Uh, but I don't want us to miss a beat, so we can do this virtually today. Uh, where we left off in class on Thursday, we were talking about uh, plate tectonics, in particular subduction zones, where oceanic lithosphere subducts under uh, another tectonic plate. In this case, in this uh, image, we have continental lithosphere. Uh, we said that there are several features associated with subduction zones, including the uh, ocean trench, deep ocean trench, and volcanism, uh, arc volcanism. In this case, it's a continental volcanic arc because it's on continental lithosphere. But we left off at the question as to why volcanism occurs along subduction zones. And that's where we're going to start with, answer that question. And so, um, interestingly enough, the reason volcanism occurs along subduction zones is water. Water is subducted down into the Earth's mantle uh, in the oceanic lithosphere, the oceanic uh, subducting oceanic lithosphere. So water is trapped in the crust, and as it's subducted down, it eventually reaches a depth of around 100 kilometers, where the pressure and temperature is large enough that the rock begins to undergo chemical reactions called metamorphic reactions and the water is, escapes. And the water escapes into the overriding mantle material which causes this mantle rock to partially melt. Um, so the water and being infused in this mantle rock causes it to partially melt. That molten material that results from partial melting, it rises because it's buoyant Okay, so, uh, so this released water percolates into the mantle above and causes it to partially melt. The partial molten material is less dense than the solid material surrounding it, so it begins to ascend, where it then uh, begins to pond to form these magma chambers, where pressure builds until there's enough pressure for uh, a volcanic eruption to occur. So that's why volcanism occurs along subduction zones, uh, because the oceanic lithosphere Subducting at long subduction zones is transporting water down into the mantle, and release of that water causes the partial mantle, me, uh, melting of the mantle rock, which is the source of the magma that, resort, uh, that results in volcanism. So, if you plan to travel the world to look for the oldest fossils on Earth, of the choices below, which can you eliminate first and not bother visiting? A. Canada, B. Antarctica, C. the South Pacific, D. Australia, or E. Michigan. Well, a lot of students are tempted to say B because they think, well, Antarctica is covered with ice, there's not a lot of life there, um, you wouldn't expect to find a lot of fossils. Uh, though that is the case today, that hasn't been the case in the past. There's actually dinosaur fossils in sedimentary rocks beneath the ice in Antarctica because Antarctica, quite frankly, wasn't always where it is today. It was at higher latitudes and it wasn't covered with ice. Anywhere else in continental lithosphere, the rocks there, the sedimentary rocks there, are fairly old, uh, especially in, in, in all three of these places. But here at sea, in the South, South Pacific, it's oceanic lithosphere. And we know that oceanic lithosphere, uh, it subducts, that is destroyed. In fact, the oldest oceanic lithosphere on the planet is around 200 million years old. And so though the continents are billions of years old, the uh, oceanic lithosphere, most of it is younger than 200 million years old because it gets recycled into the uh, interior of the planet. So we would not expect to find old fossils anywhere on oceanic lithosphere because it's so young compared to continental lithosphere. There's another question is how many plates are in this image? Two, three, four, five, or six. So you look at the image and determine what you think. All right, let's see if you got it right. All right, so I'm going to move along the surface here, and I'm going to stop every time I see a plate boundary and describe that plate boundary. So I'm starting here. There's a volcanic island arc, 
And right there is our first plate boundary. So this is a conversion plate boundary. In particular, it's a subduction zone where this plate is converging with this plate and subducting underneath it. This is the trench, and this is the arc volcanism, this volcanic island arc running along it. So that's one plate boundary. So this makes that one plate. Move along. Over here is a second plate boundary. This is a mid-ocean ridge where a new oceanic lithosphere is created and the plates move away from that ridge. All right, let me get this pen up here. So yeah, a mid-ocean ridge where the plates move away from the ridge. So that is one plate. This is two plates. Okay, so now moving in here we have our next plate boundary. I'll, I'll draw, the, draw the arrow for the direction this plate's going to. Here's our next plate boundary. This is also a convergent plate boundary in a subduction zone. There's the trench. Here's the uh, coastal mountain range because it's oceanic continental convergence subduction, like the Andes of South America. And here's the arc volcanism, the continental volcanic arc. So uh, that makes this a third plate, three. Uh, and this plate here is moving toward it, the zone. And this is our last plate because there's no more plate boundaries. So that's plate number four. So we have plate one, boundary, plate two, boundary, plate three, boundary, and then plate four. Okay. So now we're going to look at plate tectonics uh, on land. So features associated with plate tectonics that occur on land. We're going to talk about transform plate boundaries, uh, the rifting of continents, which is the breakup of continents, and mountain building. So we're going to start with transform plate boundaries. So there are several uh, fairly long transform plate boundaries on the planet, notably like the San Andreas Fault or the Alpine Fault in New Zealand. And transform plate boundaries are those in which the plates move alongside one another. So for example, San Andreas Fault, the North American plate is moving that way, the Pacific plate is moving this way. Some notable attributes of transform plate boundaries is that they do not exhibit volcanism. So the only type of plate boundary, there's no volcanism. Uh, there's large earthquakes along transform plate boundaries. Anyone who's been lived in California or knows anyone who lives in California knows that. And um, they're usually pretty short. Uh, San Andreas is one of the longest transform plate boundaries on the planet currently. Uh, we have opposing horizontal motion with transform plate boundaries, which we can see here in this offset of the road, the foundation of this house, and on this bridge that are built along transform plate boundaries. So you can see the lands moving this way and that side, and this way and that side. So the boundary actually runs somewhere through here. Same thing on this case. It's moving that way, this is moving that way, and the boundary is somewhere right there. And once again, this is moving this way, and this side's moving that way, and the boundary is somewhere in there. So we can see that opposing horizontal uh, ground motion in these images. So, a transform plate boundary shown by the black line runs through California. Where will Los Angeles be in the future? Will LA break off? Will LA move north? Will it move south? Will it move inland? Give me a second to think about an answer. So, we see that LA is part of the Pacific Plate. And we know that the Pacific Plate is moving alongside the North American Plate along this transform plate boundary. The Pacific Plate is moving this way relative to the North American Plate. And so we can expect Los Angeles to move north with this plate. And so, in fact, LA will move north. And over time, it will move north and be closer and closer to San Francisco as time moves on. Then we're going to look at divergent plate boundaries on land. Now, we know divergent plate boundaries underwater are mid-ocean ridges, but divergent plate boundaries can occur on the continental lithosphere, and that happens, a process known as continental rifting occurs. So here's a time-lapse illustration of continental rifting. So here we have uh, the continental lithosphere, so the crust and the uppermost mantle, and the convective upwelling initiated beneath it. So we have this mantle material rising and moving away. And we discussed how as this 
hot mental material rises, decompresses, which results in this decompression melting, which generates magma. Well, this, this convective upwelling is pulling the continental lithosphere in opposing directions. This causes it to begin to thin, just like if you were pulling uh, silly putty apart in between your fingers, it would be thinning. And it also causes this brittle rock to crack and fault, forming these things known as normal faults. Which normal faults are these faults that tilt in toward the center of the valley that begins to form as this lithosphere, carnal lithosphere, continues to thin as it's pulled apart. So we have volcanism in this valley, in this rift valley, these normal faults and also sediments accumulate in this valley. Eventually this valley becomes large enough that it becomes flooded. It forms what's known as a, uh, like a, a thin linear sea. And by this time, usually, the continental lithosphere is completely thinned, and the asthenosphere is right beneath the surface. When the magma erupts to the surface, it cools to form new oceanic lithosphere. And as this uh, divergence continues, we have the formation of a new ocean basin. So here is an illustration which uh, you can an animation which I'll let you, uh, when you download the PowerPoints from Blackboard, uh, click on this and watch it. So some features we see of continental rifting, uh, we see a rift valley with volcanism in it, and this is a divergent plate boundary, so the lava and magma involved in it is going to cool to form igneous rock basalt. So we have basalt forming in this valley, and because it's the valley, sediments are also going to accumulate here. And so we're going to have sediments that accumulate that can form plastic sedimentary rocks. So the typical rocks we'd expect to find in a rift valley are basalt, uh, basalt, which is an extrusive igneous rock, and plastic sedimentary rocks like conglomerate, sandstone, shale, and so forth. We also have these normal faults. These fault, uh, and these, it's kind of like stepping uh, feature in the rock caused by the faulting and sliding of the rock along these cracks that point in towards the valley. So, see these are little time. These are photos from different uh, points of along the uh, progress of continental rifting in the animation. And you can see how the continental lithosphere begins to thin. The valley form begins to form. We have volcanism. Sediments accumulate in the volcanism. So we have basalt from the volcanism and sediments and eventually it thins to the point where new oceanic lithosphere is created. This is currently happening in East Africa. This is known as the East African Rift Valley. And so this red region indicates uh, the Rift Valley, and you can see water is accumulating in this Rift Valley uh, in the form of lakes and rivers, and sediments are also being deposited in this Rift Valley, and there's volcanism in that Rift Valley, like Mount Kilimanjaro is a well-known Volcano, and you can see this image of the Rift Valley. You can see those volcanoes in the background, and the water and sediments accumulating in the valley itself. The Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden were once rift valleys, as the uh, Arabian Plate rifted from the African Plate, uh, and they have flooded to form these linear seas. And eventually, this Rift Valley will have most likely have a similar fate. It'll it'll flood, and a linear sea will form here, as this part of Africa separates from the rest of Africa. So, uh, continental rifting eventually forms a narrow sea, and that diversion plate boundary, the continental rift, becomes a mid-ocean ridge, a oceanic diversion plate boundary. So this process happened uh, about 200 million years ago, whenever Pangaea rifted apart. So North America and Africa were once together, and they rifted apart. So a continent, uh, rift valley formed in which basalt and, and clastic sedimentary rocks accumulated and eventually uh, that valley flooded, became a lin th uh, thin linear sea which was the basically the very beginnings of the Atlantic Ocean. And as that divergence continued the Atlantic Ocean Basin grew larger in size to its current form. So what is, the what is the best explanation for why most divergent plate boundaries are currently found in the ocean? A, the pressure of the ocean water helps the plates pull apart. B, divergent uh, boundaries on land turn into divergent boundaries in the ocean. 
C, the ocean is much easier to pull apart, forming divergent boundaries. Well, from what we just saw, the correct answer is B. Because divergent plate boundaries on land rift the continental hemisphere apart, and what what fills in there is a C, because new oceanic lithosphere is created. So now we're going to look at uh, evidence of ancient divergent plate boundaries. So if you got into a boat and went out into the Red Sea uh, and you dug down through it, what would you expect to drill through? A, all basalt, B, granite and nice, C, basalt and sediments such as sand and mud, D, granite and nice and sediments. Well, we would expect to find some basalt, but maybe something else besides basalt. We wouldn't expect to find granite and nice, granite being extrusive igneous rock, uh, sorry, intrusive igneous rock, and nice being a uh, fully metamorphic rock. What we could expect to find is basalt from the volcanism along the divergent plate boundary, it's forming the Red Sea, and sediments accumulating in that valley and, and uh, at, the ba at the bottom of the Red Sea. So we'd expect to find basalt and sediments, such as sand and mud. And so in ancient rift valley, we would uh, expect to find normal faults, as I said, those cracks that tilt down towards the center of the valley, basalt in the shallow ground, and lava flows that flowed over the surface, so basalt at the surface, and thick sediments deposited in Rift Valley that form clastic sedimentary rocks. And so, normal faulting is the result of extensional stress. When you pull the lithosphere apart, it results in this normal faulting, where the, this cracks that, that tilt down towards the center of the valley and the subsidence of the rock in the center that forms this depression. That's what creates the Rift Valley. And we can see in, in uh, uh, evidence of an ancient continental rift valley here in central Connecticut. So this is the, uh, the Hartford Basin, also known as the Connecticut River Valley. And we see we have these yellow rocks and these red rocks in this area. These yellow rocks are clastic sedimentary rocks. So we have conglomerates, uh, sandstone, and shale, where the red is basalt. And those are the two types of rocks we'd expect to find in a rift valley. And you see this thick black line here. If we look at the cross section from A to A prime, here's the cross section. So here's the surface. And uh, basically, these are the rocks beneath the surface. We can see that that thick black line is a normal fault. Uh, and so is this line running right th through here. That's a normal fault as well. So we see sedentary rock, we see basalt, and we see normal faults. So this is evidence of an ancient divergent plate boundary and a continental rift. Uh, and the Hartford Basin right here is part of a larger group of rocks called the Newark Supergroup. These all contain basalt and sedimentary rocks from the Triassic era, uh, which is when Pangaea was rifting apart. And so this was a rift valley that formed, running down through here, that formed while Pangaea was rifting apart. Now, it didn't rift along this valley, it rifted along the edge of the continent, which is out here, but uh, this is one of the valleys that formed while that divergence was occurring. Okay, as if we go back, we can see, that, for example, here that multiple valleys can form in a rift along one of these valleys. So the Newark Supergroup, like what's found in Connecticut, was probably one of these valleys here but it rifted along a valley further to the east under Pangaea rifting apart. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at mountain building. So mountain building occurs anytime you have a convergent plate boundary. Uh, in the case of oceanic continental convergence, we have subduction. And uh, most of that subduction, oceanic continental subduction, occurs along the edge of the Pacific Ocean Basin. And so whenever we have oceanic lithosphere converging with continental lithosphere and subduction, the thick continental lithosphere, it gets deformed, crumpled up, and that creates this topography, uh, like these mountains. The volcanoes also 
uh, form volcanic landforms that also contribute to the mountains. And the emplacement of large volumes of molten rock due to the volcanism also thicken the crust and add to the formation of mountains. All right. So we have granite igneous rocks that form in the interiors of these mountains. And the volcanism along these convergent plate boundaries forms the extrusive igneous rock andesite. So lava flows form andesite. So we expect to find basalt uh, from the volcanism at divergent plate boundaries. Uh, and we expect to find andesite in the volcanism along convergent plate boundaries, subduction zone volcanism. And also, sediments accumulate in this trench that are scraped off of the subducting lithosphere, and sometimes this pile of sediments that accumulates can actually reach above sea level and form some topography as well. This is called an accretionary wedge. So here, or also sometimes referred to as an accretionary prism, which we see right here, these are sediments that are being scraped off of the subducting plate. And as I said, sometimes this can pile up to reaches above sea level and form some topography as well. So sometimes volcanic island arcs, they are uh, slammed onto the edges of continental lithosphere, which that convergence also causes the formation of mountains. So here we have a volcanic island arc, and eventually uh, it gets slammed onto uh, this edge of the continental lithosphere, and that results in the formation of mountains. Okay, This is um, uh, I'll get to back to that in a little bit. So here is the west coast of South America. We have these mountains running down through here. These are the Andes Mountains. And these Andes Mountains are the results of the convergence of the Nazca Plate, Oceanic Lithosphere, with the South America Plate. And so we have that coastal mountain range results from that conversion plate boundary. Here's a picture of the Andes Mountains. It's kind of gray in color, which you'd expect because of all the andesite and they're very rough and ragged, what I like to call craggy, and that means they're actively forming. They're actively forming because of active convergence. So if you were to go to the Andes Mountains and analyze the rocks, what would you expect to see? Andesite and perhaps some granite, basalt, sediments such as sand and mud with basalt. Well, we wouldn't expect to find basalt because that results from volcanism along divergent plate boundaries. And the Andes are along convergent plate boundaries, which we do know we'd expect to find andesite. And then or that we could find granite uh, from the large magma bodies that cool inside the mountains. And so the correct answer would be A in this case. We'd expect to find some andesite and granite. So now we're going to look at continental continental convergence. This is whenever one continent slams into another. And this results in a very large interior mountain range, so a mountain range not along the coast. And so this is how the largest mountain ranges on the planet are formed, continental-continental convergence. So as you can see here, um, as this uh, plate moves this way, uh, the, the oceanic lithosphere between the two is being subducted. So ocean plate eventually is completely subducted, which results in the two pieces of continental lithosphere to begin to collide. Marine sedimentary rocks are scraped off of the oceanic lithosphere onto the overriding plate. Um, uh, and this crustal thickening, the thickening of the crust, which you can see happening, is due to the rock folding and faulting, causing it to thick and forming the mountains. So we have earthquakes, but because there's no more subduction, there's no more uh, 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 melting of the mantle rock and so there's no more volcanism and these rocks are become extremely deformed because of all this pressure and so it forms highly metamorphosed rock like gneiss actually the only environment which gneiss forms is in these continental continental collisions and eventually the plates become sutured together as one plate and at the top we found this clastic wedge which is a wedge of sedimentary rocks that were scraped off of the subducting oceanic lithosphere and then thrusted up to the top. And so that's how this limestone got to the top of Mount Everest. So this limestone here formed on the oceanic lithosphere that used to exist between India, uh, between India and Eurasia. And that 
limestone was scraped up onto the overriding plate and never India collided with Eurasia and this, all this rock was deformed forming the Himalayas that limestone got thrusted up to the top and this is a, a, an animation which you download the powerpoints from blackboard and you can uh, watch that for yourself and so the Himalayas are a good example of this type of mountain formation so we have continental continental collision which forms this large interior mountain range not along the coast uh, the Himalayas are the largest mountain range on the planet currently and they are uh, forming all along this front, this blue line, where this convergence is occurring. And this began 40 to 50 million years ago and it still continues to this day. So the Himalayas are actively forming and that's why they look so craggy, because they're actively forming. So what are some evidence of ancient convergent plate boundaries? Well, we know that uh, whenever a convergent plate boundary forms, uh, there's a lot of pressure and heat which causes rock to be metamorphosed. And we would expect to find gneiss and other metamorphic rocks uh, where we have an ancient continental, con continental convergent plate boundary. In fact, the Appalachian Mountains were formed whenever... Uh, North America collided with North Africa whenever Pangaea was formed. And so that was a continental continental collision. And there should have been nice and other metamorphic rocks formed there. And in fact, we do see a lot of nice in running up through the Appalachian Mountains. We find nice and granite running through here. And so these are all different uh, terrains that were slammed on to North America during, uh, leading up to and during the formation of Pangaea. And a lot of these rocks were metamorphosed into uh, gneiss and schist and so forth that we find in New England and running along parts of the Appalachians today. The west coast of the United States has mountain formation because um, it has a lot of volcanic island arcs that were slammed onto the edge of North America. And so we see these pink shaded regions. Those are volcanic arcs that were slammed on to the continent, which formed mountains. Submarine deposits. These are uh, sedimentary rocks that formed on the sea floor that were scraped up onto this plate during this subduction here. Subduction used to occur all along this plate boundary, but now it's only occurring right here. The rest of the plate is completely subducted. Uh, ancient sea floor. So ancient continental lithosphere has been scraped off. Continental crust has scraped up off onto the overriding plate. And uh, this is the actual ancient continent. So this is the actual original North American continent. This piece right here. So all this material has been slammed onto and added to the edge of North America. But all that coll colliding results in mountain formation. So the Catskill Mountains of today are uh, very small compared to the larger Appalachians that existed before them. Uh, and the Catskill Mountains are actually formed from older mountains eroding and depositing sedentary rock, and then whenever the Appalachians formed, those sedentary rocks were, 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 were folded. But here you can see what the Catskills today compared to what the Appalachians looked like in the past never uh, Pangaea was forming. So they are a shadow of their former selves. So if you found basalt and sandstone in layers in the area, what can you determine about geologic history? A, the area was covered in mountains that eroded away. B, the area was in the middle of the ocean. C, the area was a continent that tried to pull apart. Well, if this is the case, the area was covered in mountains and eroded away, we'd expect for the, the uh, granite and gneiss inside those mountains to be exposed. We'd expect intrusive igneous rocks and foliated metamorphic rocks. This is in the middle of the ocean. That's a divergent plate boundary uh, along which we have uh, basalt forming. Okay, uh, We wouldn't expect to find sandstone in the middle of the ocean that far away. But uh, I kind of try to pull it apart. That's also a divergent plate boundary. It forms a continental rift valley, which there is basalt, but also sand and other sediments accumulating in that valley that could form sandstone and other classic sedimentary rocks. So the answer would be C. We find basalt and sandstone. That suggests it was an ancient rift valley where a continent tried to pull apart. 
So which of the following provides the least evidence of a mountain building event? Granite and nice, folded and faulted rocks, a surface within the rock that indicates there was a lot of erosion that happened, flat sedimentary layers of sandstone and shell, or flat sedimentary layers of limestone. While the granite and nice, we would expect uh, that could be evidence of mountain building because never, as mountains erode, the granite and nice that form inside them are exposed. Uh, if rock was folded and faulted, that means that rock was squeezed, which happens during mountain formation. Uh, surface within rock that indicates there was a lot of erosion that happened. That would suggest that there was also mountains because whenever you have mountain formation, rock is uplifted. Whenever rock is uplifted to higher elevation, it begins to erode. So an erosional surface would, could indicate there was a mountain building in the past. Flat sedimentary layers of sandstone and shell. Oh, believe it or not, this it can act as evidence that there was mountain formation at one point in time because if you have mountains that form, they uh, eventually erode away. Uh, producing sediments that are transported and deposited, and those uh, that can form sandstone shells. So la those layers of classic sedimentary rock can be the sediments that were eroded from mountains that used to exist. But if we have flat sedimentary rocks of limestone, that offers no evidence of mountain formation because limestone is a marine sedimentary rock that forms on the sea floor. So there's no way that flat limestone, flat layers of limestone, which suggests that there was mountain building in the past. Which would be E. If that limestone was folded or faulted, then that would be a different story. And so that is the remainder of our lecture on plate tectonics. And so please um, uh, note any questions you have so you can bring them to class on Thursday, next time we meet. Okay, and thank you very much. And once again, I'm sorry, I am sorry for not being on me today, but hopefully uh, this can keep us uh, current.